Hallelujah. Amen. More than enough has been said about me, so I won't add on except my family, um, my wife, Julie, and our children, three children, they sent their regards. Thank you for inviting me to Asifiwe. Buana Asifiwe. Buana Asifiwe. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, I've been asked to talk about parenting the generation alpha, the generation alpha, 21st century. And um, I'll be using just once in a while, I'll be using this flip chart. So those who, who desire to see you may be in position, but if you don't need to see, that's also okay. But it's just one, two, three illustrations that I'll put on the flip chart. Um, otherwise, the key scripture for this talk is um, Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 52. Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 52. Uh, let's begin with a few descriptions or definitions. What is generation alpha? What is generation alpha? Generation alpha is the demographic cohort that succeeded Generation Z. I'll also talk about Generation Z shortly. But basically, Generation Alpha are those people, the generation of children who were born between 2010 or after 2010 to date. We are now in 2024. Next year is 2025. Um, that will be uh, the end of that generation as far as the name is concerned. <coughs> Why are they called Alpha? Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. And, uh, and so these people were born early this century, 10 years into this century. And it is estimated that um, globally, the world, the whole world through, every single week, between the year 2010 and where we are today, or where we will be next year, 2025, 2.8 million, that, that, that cohort will grow by 8.8 million people or children every single week. 2.8 every single week. Alpha, Generation Alpha is being born. <clears throat> and by the time that cohort's time is over, which is next year, 2025. These people will be expected to, be, to number about 2 billion. 2 billion children in the generation alpha by the end of next year. Now, 2 billion out of a population of, a, a global population of 8.1 billion is very many people. That's about 25%, about a quarter of mankind a quarter of mankind is what you and i are parenting is what you and i are, are are teaching because i've had the teachers are here myself i'm a teacher but i'm also a parent of people who belong to this generation so a whole big quarter so it's Thank you, um, administration, for choosing this topic because, really, if, if this is what is in our hands, a quarter of mankind, that's really, really big. <clears throat> now, as we head deeper into the end times, as we head deeper into the end times, the challenges of raising people, of managing mankind, seem to be getting stiffer and stiffer. What are the end times? I believe we all know the end times. The end times is from the time of Jesus up to now. With every passing year, we are getting deeper into the end times. So the more time passes, the, the tougher it gets for all of us, teachers, parents, and so on. Now, the um, Generation Alpha was preceded by Generation Z. Z, that, um, that cohort that was born um, in the interceding years from about uh, 19, uh, 19, 
what was that? 1990. <clears throat> Up to about uh, the year 2009. My firstborn was born in that time. She is generation Z. She was born in the year 2000. She's a millennial. And so most children, most members of generation Z, like that daughter of mine, my eldest, is a, a child. Those are children of generation X. Generation X. Okay? Generation X. So there is X, there is Y, there is Z. But me, I'm not even generation X. Me, I'm even before that. If you look at my gray hair, you'll understand. Hallelujah. There are not too many generations before Z here, or before X. My generation, there are very few. <clears throat> I thought I would find um, Mr. and Mrs. Triatemba here, Kara and Sam. Now, those ones are my generation. For us, we are of those days. Amen. Your fellow parents here, but they are not. They told me they wouldn't be able to come because they are ministering somewhere. And so, the, there's that generation of the mid 60s to the late 70s. Um, that's, you know, the generation born between 1965 and 1980, which is where I belong. That is the earlier generation. Now, we started off by being parents to Generation Z, but now I believe most of you, when I've looked around, most of you belong to around Y and Z. And so most members of this, your children, um, you are millennial parents, and uh, sometimes you are called mini millennials. Mini millennials. Turn to your neighbor and say, hello, mini millennial. Hello, mini <laughs> if you are convinced they are one, but if they look like me, don't tell them that. Because you will be deceiving them. I'm not a mini millennium. We are much earlier. Hallelujah. And so why am I pointing this out? It's because these generations, the way they've been defined, each one tends to have its own challenges. Generation X, Generation X, those who were born... Uh, in the 1980s, their challenge tend to be challenge. Their main challenge used to be or was HIV/AIDS. Even they are the parents of those people. Um, the main challenge when we were in those years was HIV/AIDS, and I can tell you with a fair amount of confidence that. I lost very many friends, I lost very many um, relatives, uh, classmates, and so on, to HIV AIDS. That was our scourge, that was our challenge, that was the challenge of our time. So that's Generation X and the baby boomers before. But now, um, Generation Z, the one which, which um, succeeded those ones, their demands were a little different. There were high demands for modern life, okay? And uh, because of that, their uh, anxiety was much higher. And I'll, I'll give you a very quick example of why, you know, the modern life is a stress to that group. And I believe some of you are part of that group, as opposed to us, the earlier people. I've told you for us, ours was HIV AIDS. I'll never forget when, um, uh, when, I, when I graduated from university, um, I started working at the New Vision. They mentioned how I, I, I was editor-in-chief of New Vision, but I didn't start off as editor-in-chief. I started at the lowest rank. And, um, but I did want, it wasn't my plan to be a journalist. It wasn't my plan. I wanted to be a banker, I wanted to be, um, you know, to do some other stuff. So I remember getting, um, I applied for a job at the British High Commission, and then they, um, they subjected us to certain tests. Um, there was a gentleman called Dr. Stockley, and uh, when the results came out, Dr. Stockley asked me to go and see my doctor. 
And long and short, I didn't even get the job. So what was my worry? I thought I must be having HIV. That's why they haven't taken me. But thankfully, uh, it was some, some infection of some sort which was treated and it went. But that was, in, our, in those days, you were worried about HIV. Now we don't worry about it like that anymore. These modern life things are not a worry for me. I do not care what vehicle I drive as long as it has four wheels. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's enough. I don't want a one wheel vehicle. I want four wheels. It doesn't matter whether it is bought from Toyota, Uganda, or from Wichibanda, or it is imported from a Subaru, from wherever. It does not matter. Those modern life things are not an issue for me. I don't care about iPhones. Hallelujah. I don't care about iPhones. I never ever owned an iPad. By that here, they are not on anymore. Huh? Are they, anyone have an iPad here? It's not relevant anymore. So for me, those modern life things. So that phase of iPhones, or rather iPads, it passed without David Sepuya ever having an iPad. Why? Because for me, my worry was HIV AIDS. It was what was killing us, our generation. Hallelujah. When we went into the COVID lockdown, those two years, how I enjoyed food. Why did I enjoy food? We could no longer buy bread every day. The way it was. And so what did we resort to? Thankfully, I have a farm and they used to allow my borderman to come home. So he would bring matoke, gonja, muogo, lumonde, all those things. Now those are things that we used to eat at school. Those of you of my generation, you are not here, so you don't know. So those for us were our things. It was not about eating pizzas. Yes, I had no problem at all. What was my problem? HIV, that was our problem. And so for me, whether I have whichever car, it does not matter. As long as you can move me from Mackenzie to the city center. Last week it took me to, to Movende. I went well and came back. The other time we were in Ginger with my family, we went for a holiday. It does not matter this modern lifestyle. Oh, houses which look whichever way. We keep saying with my wife, eh? especially when I see my parents' home, it used to be a great modern home in the 70s when we were growing up. And now when you look at it, eh? so those things come and pass. So you see people struggling to build whatever kind of house. Hey, in 20, 30 years time, boom, nothing. The older people here, you will remember, do you remember Pajero in Takula? Yes. Hey, yes, yes. Uh, is there a judge here? I hope there are no judges. You, the older people, you remember when there was a scandal in the judiciary, they were fighting over Pajero in Takula. The judges of this country. Now, if a Pajero in Takula passes there, for you, you want to pass this way. <laughs> modern lifestyle those are the things that disturb the generation hallelujah so different challenges for each generation different generations and so generation Z high demands of modern life so they are prone to anxiety to stress to stress because I haven't changed my car in so many years. By that, I used to have my own thing is that I used to change cars every eight years. I'd buy a new car. My first car was a Toyota DX. After eight years, it's a pattern by the way that established itself. I didn't realize, but after eight years, then I got a, a Subaru Legacy. It went, it did its part. Then I got a, a, a Land Cruiser. Prager, then it went. So. I didn't realize it at the time, huh? but it's just that, okay, it's the, the time has come. But there are people who change cars twice 
two, three times a term. Are they in this school? Maybe not. Because that is their worry that what is uncle's. <laughs> eh? Joseph, Uncle Joseph is what? Uncle Joseph, which car are you driving now, sir? Huh? <laughs> Toyota Alpha. So who wants to drive a Toyota Alpha here like Uncle Joseph? So people worry about that. Me, I also have to want to, 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 to drive an Alpha. The stress. Then they get stressed. Then they become corrupt. Then they misinvest their money. So that is that generation. Now, Generation Alpha is influenced by their parents' habits. Their parents are the millennials. They got into the habitual use of social media, okay? Sharing photographs, sharing videos, stories of their children. Da -da 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 -da. Hmm? Right from birth. Right from the birth of their of children, of the millennials. Everyone will know that Mary and Joseph have had... I'm not talking about Joseph. I'm talking Joseph, Mary and Joseph. Um, Matthew chapter 1. That Mary and Joseph have had a baby. Everyone will know. Because it is on social media. And then the pressure begins. The pressure begins. Now we've taken the child for whatever. I'm happy to have done this. I'm pleased. I'm honored. The picture. The picture. The word. <laughs> all those are on social media. Now the children we are raising in this generation, friend. I'm not saying it is bad. I'm just, you know, they've told you I am a journalist. Journalists, what do we do? We are observers of society. So I'm talking about what I've observed. Amen? Amen? And so, pleased to have done this. Bam! The picture is there. The children are there. All the time. All the time. Pleased to have gotten a new pair of sneakers for my baby girl. <laughs> hey. Now we are in the salon and the girl is doing this. They are putting that video because they've gone to the salon on Saturday. It is the video is on my what do they call it? My status. So that is so the children we are raising, those are the alpha. Now we, the parents, the, the Zs, generation Z and generation Y. That's the pressure we are putting on the children because they're everywhere. <coughs> I saw Aunt Faith. Um, I'm the civil Faith. Yes. Faith and my uh, wife were in the same class. Huh? Now you know, you know your friend, you know your sister. You will never, ever see a picture on status. <laughs> Is it not true? You know her. You've known her longer than I do. Me, I just came to marry her. For you, you were together, together, together. You know her. You will not see a picture of her children on, on status. Because she's a different generation. I'm not saying faith is another generation. And so we are different. And I'm, by the way, kindly, excuse me, I'm not condemning. I am just noting because of the issues we are going to raise. So we are raising children, generation X or generation alpha, which is out there in the public. They are influenced by their parents' habits. That group is the first one to experience remote um, classrooms. Remote classrooms. Remember COVID-19 lockdown? And so because they couldn't go to school, they had remote classrooms, they are, they are using their way of studying is a little different to 
um, the earlier generation. So they are using tablets, they are using computers. They, 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 there is ubiquitous streaming, you know, from early childhood. Streaming this, streaming that, streaming the other. My children know so many more things on my phone and on my computer than I know. You know, we don't have television at home. We, we made a decision some time ago. But it wasn't just, yes, we made a decision, but <laughs> it is God who made the decision for us. One day my wife was worried that, ah, this husband of mine, you are making the TV a, an idol. Because you are there, I'm supposed to be um, family altar time. And then the time of family altar is also the time of Champions League. <laughs> and so, even when you go uh, to the altar, you are not putting your heart in because the match is kicking off in how many minutes? <laughs> your heart is not there. So my wife began to pray. <laughs> this thing is becoming an idol in our home. And also, that's the very same time that the Lord also spoke to me. I, go, I went away on a retreat. I was praying that God told me those you know, things are becoming an idol. So at the same time she was praying, God was speaking to me. And anyway, to summarize it all, what did God do? One evening, the, the TV just blew boom. <laughs> that's about, that was 20, I think 14. So it's 10 years now we don't have TV. And so our children, when they go somewhere where there's TV, they are able to be a little more discerning about what's on screen. They don't just sit down and you know, you know how children go on TV. But I was making the point that because we don't have TV, so these other gadgets come in a little bit, not much, just a little bit. And so the children know things that I never heard about. So they're in a world of streaming, 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 streaming. That's generation alpha. Those are the people we are parenting now. Those are the people we are um, teaching today. And so... This generation alpha will likely be affected by the emerging use of artificial intelligence, you know, through, you know, tools like chat, GPT. These things have come. Their behavior, their attitudes, and their habits will likely be more affected by, 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 by um, these modern things than... Uh, than those before. Some people have called these, these guys Generation C, meaning Generation COVID, because they are the first generation to grow up largely or entirely in a world touched by the COVID pandemic and the response to it. But what did the COVID pandemic do? It accelerated, it accelerated existing trends in technology, it encouraged more digital communication through video calls, meetings, and so on, remote classroom, and so on. But the one small beautiful thing about it is that Generation Alpha, because of COVID, those people spent more time at home with us, with their parents, than otherwise would have been. You may say hallelujah to that. They spent more time. And so Generation Alpha is, is, has been born and is being bred in a tech-dominated world, growing up in a world that is steeped with technolo in technology. <clears throat> Gadgets and the internet are an integral part of their lives. Um, so today, unlike you and I, who used to watch TV, because I would go and watch TV, switch on the television, when I was young, in my teenage years and my 20s. These people do not only consume okay, content, but they also distribute it. So that's the kind of world they are growing in. They distribute content because of the nature of technology that they, they have. And um, 
So the influence of this, of, uh, of, on this generation of, uh, of technology, on this generation, goes beyond convenience and accessibility. It also shapes their perspectives, it shapes their values, it shapes their behaviors, because they are able to distribute, they are able to create content. I never could create content. All I did was listen to your radio or listen, listen, uh, watch your TV. But these people are able to create. So I thought I should put that context together before we look at how do we parent these people. How do we teach them in view of the fact that these are the influences around them? And so we are going to try, we are going to ask ourselves two questions and try to answer them. So in view of what I've just shared, is there a hope? Is there a promise? Ask your neighbor, is there a hope? Is there a promise? I don't know what they've told you. Um... But one thing I can say is, even in all these certain basics about parenting, certain basics about teaching, raising these children, remain the same. One, children are still children, whatever the generation. And God is still God, whatever the generation. He will still be God. Whatever the generation, whether it is baby boomers, whether it is X, Y, Z, P, W, Y, you know, he's still God. And his promises are the same. Let's look at some of his promises. Psalm 103, verse 13 to 18. Psalm 103, verse 13 to 18. <clears throat> um, he says that as a father, his children saw the Lord it is those who fear him for he knows our frame the mercy of the lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children it is the same to those who keep such to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them and so at least we have that confidence that children are still children god is still god whatever the generation. Then secondly, we have an excellent model of a child in the, in the scriptures, in the Bible. Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 52. It's a familiar story. You remember when um, uh, uh, Joseph, Mary, and their family went to, I don't know how many children they had at the time, but they would go to the Passover feast in Jerusalem. They are living in Nazareth, so they go to Jerusalem. Those of you who, who have been to Israel will know Nazareth is quite far from Jerusalem. But it was incumbent upon all families to go to at least three feasts in Jerusalem every year. The Passover, uh, Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks, and um, the Feast of Tabernacles. And then it ends... The story tells us, the Bible tells us that on their way back, one day into the journey back, they realize the boy Jesus is not around, he's not in the group. And so they go back to look for him. It's a familiar story. And then Jesus says, hey, he tells his parents, you know, I had to be with in my father's house and so on. We all know that bit. <clears throat> but here is the key thing. They find him amazing the scholars and they say that from that point on he goes on to advance in wisdom and favor wisdom and favor and it says the scripture says now after they pick him up it says that during the years in which it says that he goes back he is obedient to them he listens to them and he goes back to them and then what does the bible say it says four things about him after this, that he increased in wisdom. He increased in wisdom. What is wisdom? In this, in this context, it is intellect and practical holiness. And so that's the model that God is telling us. You know, for a child, children of around that age, we need to help them grow 
in wisdom. Wisdom. Intellect and practical holiness. So we need the way, the things we expose our children to, the things that we, um, we, we the things that we, we um, teach them, or the things we allow them to access, should be such that they will grow in intellect, that they will grow in practical holiness. Hallelujah. Because that's what Jesus did. There's something, let me tell you a small story, something which worried me a few years ago. Um, our Jason, Jason is our older boy. The girl is and she's at LDC now, but Jason. I remember a time when, when he was about two, three years old, we used to play a lot of gather music. Bill Gaither, anyone here know Bill Gaither was from it's for us. You see, it is, it is faith. Anyway, it is okay. Then you are my sister. That is music for us, old people, older generation. And so Jason was singing Bill Gaither stuff. So I looked at my wife one day and I said, Hey, nice this boy goes singing Bill Gaither stuff at school. They'll say, You boy, what have you been consuming? Because that is ancient. Ancient worship, ancient music. What do you expose them to? So we are deliberate, even about. I don't have an issue with the worship group here, but I have an issue with many worship teams in our in our in our churches. The kind of dressing they do, you know. You are a worship leader and you grow up. You worship leader, you worship leader, and you worship leader. Who are you worshiping? Does this worship the Lord yesterday? The dances, the dances that they've introduced in many of our churches, they have picked them from the world, and we are there to worship leader. And so because of that, even though the words that the people are singing are good, could be picked in scripture. But the bigger thing they are doing is the dancing the word, those things. And so we do not want our children to be picking up. If learning worship music means seeing that kind of dance, for us we decided no. They would rather listen to Bill Gaither. The Bill Gaither guys put on their long jackets. Now you know Bill Gaither. <laughs> so, but anyway, I got a little worried that now my son will go see Bill Gaither. I can't see modern worship. So, what are you letting, what you expose them to is critical because that's what they'll pick up, that's what they'll run with, that's what they'll run with. So practical holiness. The way you dress, if you are worship leaders here, it is practical holiness. It doesn't matter how good your voice is, how anointed your voice is. But if you are dressed, or if you are dancing, silly stuff, it's not practical holiness. So Jesus grew in practical holiness. That's what the Bible says. Then it also says he grew in stature. He grew in, increased in stature. What is stature? That is growing to adult life. Now those of you who have children, so Jesus was 12 years old at that time. So if you have children at 12, going 13, 14, 15, there are certain physical things that will begin to change in the child. Physical. A little hair here, deeper voice, you know, private parts and so on. So that is the physical stature. He grew in stature. That's what the Bible says. At Troll, from Troll, when he went back to his parents' home, he grew in stature. That scripture also says that Jesus increased in favor with God. In favor with God. 
Now, what is in favor with God? That is spiritual closeness to the Father. That is what should be happening from the time a child is 12. Because at the age of 12, you begin making certain choices. Not all choices, but they are more independent than say they were when they were six or three or eight. So growing in favor with God, gr 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 increasing in favor means grow a close, a, a closer relationship with God. That is what we should be trying to engender in our children once they reach that stage. Because that's the model. The model has been given to us in the scriptures. Hallelujah. But it also says that Jesus increased in favor with men and women, I believe. Favor with men. So that is social respect. And so as a, as a child, he would have... Um, uh, yeah, you're growing up in the village and whatever. People, had, you, you, they better ref, respect you. And so the, these ideals... Uh, of a child crossing from preteen to teenage years. This is the model. Now, if you do not, if you cannot have that model, if you cannot, if you don't enforce that, ensure that there is another challenge that comes in. And this one we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. This is the failure to model the children well. This is what it says. That, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. They'll be slanderers. They'll be without self-control. They'll be brutal. They'll be despisers of good. They'll be traitors. They'll be headstrong. They'll be haughty, they'll be lovers of pleasure that, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That is what happens when we fail to model the children properly. So uh, this is typical of the end times. You tend to see a lot of that coming in. And so there are many reasons why we would arrive at 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 5. What are the reasons? It is because of undiscipled kids. Reason number one is relativizing things. When we move, when we stop considering absolutes to be absolutes, good is good. Before God, good is good. Before God, obedience is obedience. So once permissiveness comes in, once relativizing comes in, then, they, then the, the problem will come. Then secondly, the lack of awareness of the devil's schemes. You know, the, um, the new age, there is what they call the new age, uh, uh, the new age, uh, the characteristics of the new age are uh, encapsulated in something called the Alice Bailey program. I do not have time for that. But basically, it puts away boundaries, boundaries to sex, boundaries to... Uh, to respect for, for authority, boundaries, you know, all those boundaries, all those absolutes that God has given us are, are removed. And once we allow them, whether at a personal level, family level, school level, society level, then the children will not grow like that. So the failure to, to put boundaries... Then the third one is about the foundations, the formative years. Um, I am running out of time. I wanted to illustrate something, what I call God's cycles of seven. Um, let me just write it quickly. I hope I can do it very quickly, even with my limited time. <laughs> God's cycles of seven for human um, lifespan cycles of seven. God works in seven. The first seven that God works in is uh, the mothers here will know uh, the seven months. The first seven months 
of pregnancy, the first seven months of pregnancy um, is what is known as fetal, like in fetus, fetal viability. Okay? At the age of seven months, a child can be born. A baby can come out of the womb and will survive. Seven months. Fetal viability. The two months are extra rent that God gives children in the womb to reach nine months. But seven is sufficient. Then, from zero to seven are the formative years. Formative years. Now, in these years, let me come back to them shortly. Let me, let me exhaust it. Whatever you want to do in your child, whatever it is, whether it is obedience, whether it is making their bed, whether it is showering properly, welcoming visitors, praying, whatever it is, the first seven years is key, is foundation. Once you do it, it's okay. It will be okay. Do not miss the first seven years. And therefore, it is best for the first seven years to be spent with mommy and dad at home as much as possible. I hope the school authorities will not bring police to take me away. I, I don't, I'm not saying, <laughs> they may say you're saying take your six-year-olds away from as if you I'm just giving the revelation or the God's patterns because God, God, God is above as if you is above Orchard Wood School, my children in Orchard Wood. So the first seven years, whatever it is you want to impart in the child, better do it then. Because beyond that, you will not. 14 to 21, that is when we do formal education. That's the best time for more education, classroom. You can give them away to the teachers. Hallelujah. And I'm not saying the teachers of us feel are bad. But you are the best teacher of your child. Yes. Zero to seven. 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 seven to 21. Yeah, those are seven times two. Those are two sevens. Cycles of seven. We are talking about cycles of seven. So 14 to 21 is formal education. Then when they finish, I think many people graduate around 21 years old, not so? So after that, what normally happens when you finish, you finished education? What next? Work, 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 work. Sorry, by the people may say, this man is speaking a lot of rubbish. This, this one comes from um, Psalm 90 verse 10. Okay? You know, Psalm 90 verse 10 talks about 70 years or 80 if you are strong. It's the biblical um, uh, life, uh, the, uh, life expectancy. Psalm 90 verse 10. So 70. We are working around 77. 70, of course, is 7 times 10. Two divine numbers. And so 14 to 21. Yeah, sorry, 21 is graduation. Then you begin to do what? To work. Amen? And you work up to when? You work up to when? You work up to the time God has said you work. And God says in Psalm 90 verse 10 that at 70 years, I've given you up to 70 years because he put us in the world to do what? To work. Hallelujah. Are you getting the point? So, you work up to... So, 70 is the biblical retirement time. Say with me, hallelujah. If you've understood that. <laughs> okay, we are doing some mathematics. So, so you've gone to school up to? 21. 70 minus 21 is? 49. 49. 49 is a full... Jubilee cycle. That's why. Where are the lawyers? 
Where are the lawyers? They didn't come. They are busy making money. Here are the lawyers. When you give your leases, you give them for how long? 49 years. It's a biblical concept. The whole concept of Jubilee. Worth 749 years. That's why it is. So friends, I'm not, I hope I'm not speaking rubbish. Because it's from scripture. Jubilee. Jubilee. 49 years of work. And then normally after you've started working, what happens next? What happens next? Normally, normally, normally. Huh? Marry. marry. You marry. How long oh, you get married? How long did Mr. That was who? Jacob? Was it Jacob? I, I said Jacob, one of the who worked for how long? Jacob. Yeah. Jacob. Seven worked for how long? 14. For 14 years. Yes, but the second seven was because he had been deceived. They, they had a problem of telling lies in their yeah. So, <laughs> work for some seven years and you get married. Hallelujah. Work for seven years and get married. Don't wake up tomorrow. I graduated today. Tomorrow I'm going to marry. Whose daughter are you going to take to nowhere? Fast work for this guy has understood me. So you work seven years, then you get married. So those are the cycles of seven, but. What is the critical one? I'm trying to tell you these two. Okay? The formative years. This is, as you bring up generation, uh, what? Alpha. Please, please do it in that time. Julia and I have imparted in our children certain things. Now I can confidently leave them with my laptop and I know they will not do certain things. Because in these seven years they must understood certain things. And I'm not saying they are sinless. Yeah? But, but there is a confidence that we have. Amen? Amen? Let me try to wind up because my time is running so, out. I thought so I should tell you. the principal to add you time. <laughs> 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 that they will ask the principal to add new time. But now, what if the principal increases your school fees? Time is money. And so, um, friends, those two bands are critical. First seven years and these 14 years. Those are critical. That is where you should lay your emphasis as parents. That is where you should lay your emphasis as, yeah. as teachers. Amen. Why? Because there is an evil agenda out there. Mainly the media and electronic means. By the way, when I say these things, evil agenda and I say media, remember you are speaking to a media, it is a media person who is speaking to you. So I know. I know. And so we are living in the digital era um, where these things are. So if we don't take care, we shall be losers. And so what do we have in this time? Prayer is going away. Parental authority is being taken out, you know, taken down. Let me tell you an interesting thing. And please don't think I'm excessive. You may say, this guy is mad. This guy and his wife. When the children, they do not enter our bedroom without knocking. It's something they learned a long time ago. Now I don't care. But they always have to ask first. If I'm in the dining room, Daddy, may I enter your bedroom and I use your toothpaste? They ask. Remember, it's been in the seven years we told them parental authority. So I've decided not to, I don't mind if they go there. But because it entered their system. Parental authority. They know it. They know it.
The system, the time these people are growing up, says sex is free. Make abortion legal, make it easy. The time we are living in says divorce is easy and legal. Free people from the concept of marriage for life. Make sexual, homosexuality and other counter sexualities an alternative lifestyle. Use media to promote and change mindset. Humanism, human rights, humanism. And so how do we recover from all this as we parent our children in this time? The, the principles are in the Bible. I've just given you um, the, the, the story of Jesus, the boy Jesus. Now, expose your children to key biblical or divine concepts. When Mr. Chisembo was introducing me, he said, he told you how uh, I, 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 I'm in prophetic ministry, prayer ministry. Now, what we've done with our children, we've exposed them to these things. They are part of deep prayer. They come to prayer conferences, the things that they understand, because they've been exposed to that. They've seen deliverance. They know how deliverance happens. They know the depth of prayer. I'm not talking about our Father in heaven, the grace of our Lord. Yes, that is prayer. But there is the deep prayer. These fellas know it. So expose them. That is how you bring up this. Expose them. There is a tendency that because there is a conference huh, this weekend, then uh, Andrew calls his sister Susan. Susan, may I drop off the kids? I'm going to the conference. Goodness me, take the children. How will they understand this thing? How? They call our children prophetic children. So, but they've gotten to understand, appreciate this thing. That is how we counter. That is how we counter the digital era and oh, its yeah. stupidity. Let the children know a good truth. Let them steep themselves in. Don't send the children away because you are going to a prayer meeting in the evening. Hey, now will they learn to pray? <coughs> prayers that are not good night, bedtime prayers. They have to be there. Hallelujah. Set boundaries in those first seven years. Some of the boundaries we set were no television, I told you. God helped us, he blew the television. No soda. They don't drink soda. <laughs> you know, because those are lifestyle challenges. Phones at 18. Phones at 18, they know we. Caleb is eight years, seven years. He keeps talking about when he will get his phone. It's more than half a lifetime away. But he is looking forward. <laughs> they know their sister. She never got her phone at 18. She put me under pressure for about two, three years because in their school other children had. I said, no. No, she's 23, going 24. She has a phone. She's going to have a phone for the rest of her life. Hallelujah. So why the rush? If your child is going to live 70 years or 80 if he or she is strong, there is so much time for them to have a phone. They don't have to have it. Let them get it at 18 and then have it up to 80 years. 80 times minus 18 is what? 62. So they'll have a phone for 62 years. It is called delayed gratification. Don't gratify children because of social pressure, because of adverts that are on TV. You will lose these children. You will lose generation alpha. I hope I'm making sense. If I'm not, my car is there. I drive off and I go home. <laughs> there, my family is waiting for me. 
Ay, guapo, eh. So apply divine principles to prepare children for teen age. Jesus was 12 years old. At the age of 13, the Jews have something they call bar mitzvah for boys. And then, actually for girls, it's 12 years old. Bat mitzvah. Bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah. Now that's the time when a child is given that respect that now you are going to begin it's called the age of maturity. Okay? Mitzvah means commandments. So it's a time to begin to understand on your own the commandments of God. So pay attention to the 12 to 13 years. That's why it's mentioned in the Bible. That's the only time we hear of the boy Jesus from his babyhood. And we do not hear about him again. When next do we hear about Jesus? At 30, at his commissioning. So it is a critical age. Pay attention to that. And so it's a time to talk to, let them get maturity. It's a time, say, for sex education. Okay? It is you, parent, not the teachers. If you're a teacher here, please put up your hand and say hallelujah. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> Sex education is not for teachers. It is for parents. It is the time to talk to them. Jason, my son, is turning 12 next week. He's turning 12 next week. So I've been in trepidation out do I talk this boy about his things. <laughs> But now the time has come. I can't run away. So I'm going to take him. I'll take him to his favorite place. His favorite restaurant. It's called Coffee at Last. I know his favorite meals. I'll get him to order his favorite meal. So I'm saving. You can have my savings if you want. So I'm going to talk to Jason. Next week, please pray with me. <laughs> because it is mine. It is my duty. It's not anyone else. So, parent, it is your duty. It's not for the teachers. And because the evil agenda wants to take these things away, so they introduce so called sex education in the curriculum. But who's going to teach? Teachers, I have no problem with you people. At least the ones of uh, Asifu. But what teacher? What, what does this teacher subscribe to? Who's going to teach your child? Hello. No. What does he subscribe to? What is their private life like? Why do you entrust him or her with your child? What do they believe in? What is their private behavior? You know what you believe in. You know your private behavior. You're not going to wish or impart bad stuff on your child. Will you? So, sex education, it is yours. I'm about to finish. So, what am I going to tell Jason? You can add to my things, okay? So, what I'm going to do next week is what is called a key talk on his maturation. Now, I have been wanting to do this thing. I had to do it in the December holidays. And I was very busy. I was finishing certain consultancies. I didn't get time. But God, I think this is God's time. So as I was reading this scripture, Luke chapter 2, verse 15, 41. 1, 40, 50, 51, 50, 51, 50. It just said, oh yes, of course the model is there. So, when we go for our key talk, I have my Bible with me, I'll say, Jason, read. 
Now go up and look, chapter 2. I said, read. Jesus was our old trial. And after that, he the status. So I'll tell him, Jason, you are now 12. It's the time of your maturity, maturation. Because that's what the Bible says. The Jesus you love. That's the time he grew in maturity. Then I'll tell him that sex is God's idea. Let him hear it from his father. It is God's idea. It's not anyone else. Then I'll tell him that um, I'll, I'll take him through the human reproduction basics. You know, the, the film is playing in my mind. <laughs> but please pray with me this week. It's my week of trial. <laughs> and so I'll tell him because sex is God's idea, it has to be kept within his, his boundaries. The boundaries that God put. That's what I'm going to tell him. I'll tell him the importance of personal commitment to living a life of purity before you know, he gets married. So these are the things. So do not seed, do not give away the, um, that responsibility to other people. And I'm not saying by this school it is okay, Mr. Headmaster sir, it is okay to, for you to teach. Because I trust what as if you were to teach because you're a Christian school. But the primary responsibility, let me tell you this one, don't sit back and think that because they'll teach it at school, then I won't do it. There is a way, if it comes for a boy, if it comes from mommy, for a, or from daddy, and for a girl, if it comes from mommy, there is a way to sin. You have a relationship, you have a spiritual relationship with your children. That the teacher does not have. Yeah. He or she will remember this thing forever. But if you leave it to the teacher, even Christian children are stubborn. Christian children, even they, they may have names for their teachers. <laughs> you don't want him to remember that his first exposure to sex education was from the teacher whom he calls a funny name. Hallelujah. Let the teachers be a supplement, but the first thing should come from you. 